Welcome to Mindscapes, our series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy help define our contemporary world. My guest today is indeed a woman of many parts. I first uh, heard of her with, uh, when she won the award for her play, The Harvest, uh, but I've since discovered that she has indeed been working on, on many, many areas. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Manjula Padmanabhan. Manjula, you've been, you studied economics and you studied history, you did uh, exhibitions of your paintings on the pavement, you've done a mm. comic strip. I could go on forever. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> you've sort of written a children's novel, you've done short stories. Um, indeed, sort of a mistress of, of, of many parts. I wasn't going to call you a Jill of many trades. But person, person. <laughs> person, I prefer yes, I neutral words. <laughs> um, it sort of almost begs itself the question that um, what do you identify yourself as? I mean, do you ever sort of sit down and say, who am I? Yeah, I'm, I'm asked this very often, but I don't, I find I don't uh, tell myself. I don't wake up telling myself, well, today I'm a writer. Um, but I'm frequently asked to say, do I think of myself as a, an artist or as a writer? And I can, I can only repeat what I frequently have said. You know, I, I don't make that choice. It's um, it's not, and it, they're not they're not in any way um, in opposition. Sure. But um, well, how do these sort of choices get made for you? Uh, well, earlier um, when I when I was a lot younger, when I was in college and uh, after college, when I was earning my own living, I think the deadline dedicated um, mm -hmm. the deadline dictated everything. You mean the deadline to make a living? Yes, the deadline to make a living. I paid. I, I paid rent for my uh, paying guest accommodation. So um, I had to make my. You know, I made money on a per illustration basis, and it was um, it was a hard struggle to keep track of um, payments and of running after them and 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 doing the work. So in that sense, it was just a question. If I, if I drew, it was in order to finish a commission. Mm -hmm. but, but obviously, there were some sort of uh, creative passions, preferences lurking inside you. Otherwise, why a pavement exhibition? Oh, that's just it, a pavement <laughs> exhibition, because I could not get into a gallery. So you know, uh, certainly in the beginning, um, all my choices were dictated by, by whatever was possible. And I wrote or I draw based on on the commissions I got. And I, I certainly didn't think, you know, I think when I was a, 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 you know, a young child, a, a teenager, at that time I think I thought of myself um, as a writer who could draw. And while I was in, in college, I began to realize that it was much easier to sell drawings than it was to sell um, written work. And it, it seemed, well, okay, I could do the drawings in my spare time, whereas I, could, I would keep my, my writing for the serious time that I would find, I, I was sure. But in mm. fact, that didn't happen. Mm. But what were the processes <coughs> of, of uh, sort of acquiring uh, you know, skills in, in, in drawing? We sort of assume that a writer's skill can sometimes somehow happen spontaneously. No, I don't think either happens spontaneously. I think that's one of the great myths that, that our artists and writers just wake up one day and and can draw or write. I mean, I think every every skill requires the training and the 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 time and effort. And in my case, I would say, whereas um, I, my family is very artistic, everyone in my family can draw, can write, um, and I certainly used to draw all through my childhood. But it was really specifically the magazine I worked for in Bombay called Parsiana, and the editor for that magazine, his name is Jangir Patel. He was an, uh, an outstanding editor and a wonderful um, uh, person for, for being critical, for his critical eye and for his, his ability to train another person to um, maximize their potential. Um, I'm smiling because it was never easy. <laughs> He was, uh, his standards were high, and it was quite frequently difficult to meet them. But if you look at the work, the drawings that I did when I started working for Parsiana, which was when I was uh, 19, and maybe even six months later, there's such a huge change in, in the, I remember he used to, um, you know, I, he, he would ask for details, like I would perhaps draw 
um, a Parsi shirt, you know, the you know vest, uh, and uh, I would show it to him, and he'd say, "Well, that's okay, but the stitching is wrong." You know, that kind of that eye for detail, um, that that sort of training is invaluable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is obviously sort of uh, the, the 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 training and in, in, in the technique of drawing and, and the craftsmanship of it, uh, but you ran uh, very successful comic strips. And then you suddenly move on to a completely new realm, that not only that your skill and simplification and simplifying an image, picking on essential elements of it, but also making a comment, a statement, making people laugh uh, from, from something. From um, I would, again, I would say that, well, the comic strip grew out of uh, my having worked as an illustrator. I worked with Parsiana and then um, moved, in, moved on to work for the Sunday, Mag Sunday Times, Sunday Times um, magazine, the, uh, Sorry, the Times of India Sunday magazine with Daryl De Monte, and he was a wonderful editor as well. Um, Daryl used to send me um, articles to illustrate, and I think he chose them very well. They suited the kinds of things that I like to draw. Um, but I began to grow tired of illustrating other people's comments. And maybe because when one is drawing, one is alone with one's work, there's, um, you know, one, it used to take me, let's say, five or six hours to do a drawing. Um, during that time, one's mind is working, and uh, other ideas, other thoughts, um, are, you know, are running along parallel to the work that one is doing. And I, I suppose somewhere along the line, I must have wanted to express my my own ideas, my own thoughts. And one of the ways of doing that is to have a comic strip, because in a comic strip, um, you say what you wish to say, and if you find an editor who will publish, well, then you're very fortunate. And I was fortunate. So I was able to publish a comic strip. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've then sort of um, went on to uh, uh, work as an as an art critic for a year and a half almost uh, for that's a newspaper. With, yes, that's with the Indian Express and Daryl De Monte. Um, I think Daryl asked me to write reviews because uh, he 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 was looking for someone who actually knew a little bit about art um, and who would not be swayed by the art world. And I, and I, you know, I was very young, and uh, I think he, he felt he could leave me with that and not have to worry too much. He paid me a wonderful compliment, and I, I always remember him for that. I gave him my first review, and he looked at it, and he made little, you know, he made little editing uh, proof uh, checkings, you know, the capitals and so on. But he sent it off saying, how nice it is to read copy that doesn't need correction. That was a wonderful, wonderful remark, and um, it, you know, it gave one so much confidence. And it was very interesting to do the reviews because, uh, without having to to go um, with with the newspaper behind me, I probably wouldn't have seen so many shows. And it gave me a, a, a year's glimpse uh, of what um, was going on in art. You, know, you mentioned that you had a, a, a little knowledge of art before you went in there. Uh, in, in a, a, a critic in sort of embodying, representing sort of an average educated reader, how important is this uh, prior knowledge to be educated in what you're writing about? Um, I do think that uh, I was fortunate to grow up in a family which was very conscious of art. Um, my sister studied art. Um, we traveled in Europe when I was a child. I saw a lot of um, uh, very um, sophisticated work as a child. I mean, when you see things as a child, you're not really even conscious of its value. You just see it as part of your environment. It's only when you grow up that you look back and you realize that you were fortunate to have that kind of exposure. I did. And as a child, I had very strong opinions about art. For instance, when I was small, I could never understand what worth there was in modern art at all. I think I was maybe 13 or 14 before I be began to see any value in modern art. Uh, till then, I was only and exclusively interested in European classical art. And um, it, I, I think, you know, I, when I meet very young people these days, and I find them so it's two things. In the first place, uninformed about art. Um, they're not, apparently not given a strong education in art. They're not either taught how to, how to see work, works of art, how to understand them. And they're also very um, 
arrogant about their opinions. It's it, um, art is treated as a, a type of a candy. You know, you say you like it or you don't like it. You don't have, you're not given any equipment with which to understand the whys and the backgrounds, the underlying uh, ideas. But why is that important in, 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 in sort of the larger scheme of things? <laughs> <laughs> How can I say it in a few words? Why is it important? It's important because it is really through the arts that we understand ourselves as human beings. It is, I mean, every animal has to find its own living. Make a living making a living is what goes on in every, every part of the world. Every creature from a cockroach to a tiger has to make a living. But the ability to, to uh, produce art and appreciate the abstract realm, that is human. And uh, I would say, if we want to understand and enjoy our potential as human beings, we have to know about art. And uh, it's, it seems so sad that the average school child is taught how to make a living, but not how to understand the uh, understand how to enjoy that living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how much of that is, is 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 also a process of acquiring an appropriate vocabulary? Uh, you know, we'll be talking about the many different things you've done, mm -hmm. and each one of them, uh, apart from sort of the the, the innate sensibility, uh, sort of uh, a coarsening, uh, a refining of sensibility through exposure to art, mm -hmm. through aesthetic, to the intellect, but there is a unique vocabulary for everything that you do. Uh, how important is that to be sort of formally learnt, acquired? I, I well, you know, an education can give you the tools. What you do with the tools is up to you. But what, what is uh, frequently very sad is to see that the average young child is not given the tools. The average young person is pushed through school and college as if the aim of school and college is to equip you to work, to be a worker ant. This is what is sad. It, it is, I mean, if, if I knew that there were courses in, in learning to be happy, um, learning to enjoy something, I would be thrilled to hear that, but I don't see that. Mm -hmm. But do you think it's something that, that you could really teach someone to be happy? Well, it seems that in the lack of it, they're not happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does it take to make you happy? Oh, um, uh, it's not difficult for me to be happy. But um, I think it's easier for me to say what I don't like. I don't like um, being forced to do anything. And. Um, I like a lot of silence. I like a lot of uh, space. Um, I like solitude. I spend a lot of time by myself. And um, I find that I'm growing. Um, I mean, my friends and family will, will uh, recognize this only too well. I find that I'm growing very reclusive. And I, I, I don't know whether that's the result of being in a city where uh, one sees crowds wherever one gro goes. There's a sense of being um, oppressed by, by too many people. And I, I know that um, you know, I'm, I'm happy when I'm by myself. Mm -hmm. And what happens when you're by yourself? You just sort of watch your thoughts go by mindfully? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have to confess I spend a lot of time um, just, you know, uh, lazing about. If I, if I have the chance, um, I read, um, I work, but it's, you know, I, 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 I never think of myself as an industrious person. I work in a very, um, very casual manner. Um, I don't, I don't like feeling the uh, oppression of, uh, I mean, this is now very different to when I was younger and I had to meet a deadline. Perhaps because of that, I really hate the sense of, OK, I'm doing this to meet a deadline. I like to do things because I want to do, it, do them. Um, and so whereas I do spend hours in front of my computer, um, I, I like to feel that I'm there because I want to be there rather than because I have to be there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you've been sort of, um, you've been a critic. We were just talking about that. Uh, and, and you've now sort of, you're in the public eye in a sense, you're written about and there are critics writing about you. Uh, how, how do you sort of respond to that? Well, in my view, what matters is my relationship with my work. 
once the work is done, once it's out of myself, um, while I'm really interested to hear what people say, I feel that it is not within my domain to, to be um, obsessed. Um, I'm glad if someone says good things, I'm interested if they say critical things. And in many ways, criticism is far more interesting. It is always, however painful, however um, damaging or destructive, uh, a truly critical review sometimes can make you can make you look uh, with with a very new and fresh perspective on one's work. I don't think anyone wants a critical review. I don't think anyone can say that they actually want it. But when you see something negative, um, even even in the the I mean, you know, sometimes it can happen that a person will write a negative review and it will be um, entirely personal. It, uh, and yet, even in that, you can see things that offer you perspectives that you wouldn't. You see, people who like you, people who like your work, will never say uh, the damaging but perhaps true things. But what about a work in progress? Do you tend to bounce it off people? No. No, I don't. I usually work very privately. There might be, at most, one or two people with whom I might uh, talk an idea through. But usually, I work on something very much in private, often in secret. I don't, I don't really even like people to know I'm working on something. It, it can, or, I mean, um, I am very affected, very deeply affected by the opinions of people very close to me. The closer they are, the more, um, the more I can be derailed by their uh, reactions. And it's not, you know, it's, in a sense, it's to protect the work that I'm doing, that I keep myself reclusive. Uh, and since I am in the, since, ever since getting that award, I no longer have to work to a deadline for money. As a result, I have much more time to, um, to spend with just myself looking at what I want to do and how I want to do it. I've started to create walls around myself in order that I can do that without even the thoughts of my friends and family um, affecting how I find my work. Um, I enjoy that, but I know that my friends and certainly some of my family feel that um, I'm becoming a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in this process of, of, of creating, uh, uh, particularly as you've said, post your award that it's given you a, a, a freedom that you haven't had in a sense before, um, what is the impulse uh, uh, to create? Is it sort of, you know, the, the traditional classic uh, impression of, of, of an artist trying to get something out, a, a catharsis, a release of anguish, um, or, or, or to give form and substance to internal chaos? Uh, what are the impulses that come I don't know what you? they are for other people, but um, I, for myself, I would say, it, what, as one goes along, as one you know grows older, um, one's responses to to the world and the ideas that are created as a result of of those responses um, begin to need expression. So I I, I mean I, I keep looking for analogies that will. Uh, describe a creative person's uh, state of mind. On, this is only because one is asked questions. And one of the analogies I used recently, and I kind of enjoyed that, was um, it's a bit like being a gardener. And um, sometimes you plant seeds because you've chosen them. Quite often, what you find in your garden just grew, grows of its own accord. And you can either help it along or, uh, or remove it. Or uh, if you're a good gardener, which I'm not, I'm completely uh, ill-equipped for growing anything. Um, but I, I like the analogy. I, like, I would like to be a gardener, let's put it that way. And I do, I do love to sit in, in a, an attractive garden. I do very, very much enjoy seeing plants. Um, and in that sense, 
the, the idea of uh, using my work like a gardener, that is letting, letting ideas grow and, and helping them um, towards a, a, a complete and attractive form. Mm -hmm. That's maybe... Well, it's, it's well, to take that analogy further, how do you choose which plants and which flowers uh, to nurture? Okay, mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, it, if we take the analogy as I gave it to you, that is, some, some seeds are planted. And so let us say, uh, in my wanderings, I, I see, let us say, a, the seed for an idea, and I might plant it. Um, others happen to just be growing of their own accord. Um, just like the way I imagine a gardener chooses to show a plant, you, you have a sense of when something is complete, when something has reached its point of maturity. It will announce it of its own accord. I mean, that, that is what, at, at least in my opinion, that, that is what makes um, creative work something other than uh, an assembly line factory worker's uh, state of mind. It, it, is, it is organic, and the work itself will tell you when it is done. Um, you really just have to wait. Mm -hmm. And at, at what point to sort of choose, or, or does it get chosen for you, the well, this, this time it's going to be a short story, this time it's going to be a play, or a, or a novel, or, um, or a painting? Something in the nature of the idea. Um, some ideas, are, you know, I, I wouldn't like to tie myself down to any defin <laughs> <laughs> definitions, mm -hmm. but um, I would choose, I mean, short stories, for instance, because the, the form is, um, you know, it, it is, is self-contained and is, is small, it's short. You know that it's a, it isn't a book, so that the, the kind of effort that you put into it is going to be very different. I'm only, I, 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 though I've, uh, I have four books now, t published books to my credit, only the, the book by Picador called Getting There is, was actually written as a book. And I can now say, having written this book, I can say, how very different that effort was, because, um, because I knew that this, the one story that was going to be contained in this book um, would, you know, would occupy more space than a short story, which uh, is necessarily, I mean, most short stories, it can sometimes happen that a short story is long enough that it becomes a novella, or it, it stands by itself with one other short story, maybe. But, by and large, a short story occupies space in a very different way. It won't be alone on a bookshelf, whereas a book will be alone on a bookshelf. And somehow, <laughs> the fact that you know that, that there isn't going to be anything supporting it but the idea of that one book, it alters the nature of the book mm -hmm, itself, mm -hmm. the way that you it it, it, it. it sounds so enviable to be able to be sort of reclusive and to flow and surrender with your sort of ideas, dreams, creativity, and, and, and uh, are you ever tempted by perfection? You're sort of recognized now almost sort of as being very good at, at, at a number of different things. I'm not aware uh, But what of about that. getting better <laughs> at something and sort of... That is, how can I say, it's a hope. It's not anywhere near a given. And I, th I think I would be very afraid if I found myself thinking to myself, oh, well, I'm wonderful. I never think like that. <laughs> I, it's, it's very much more, I, I remember going to uh, Jai Selmer and um, being told by, by the um, owner of the hotel that we were staying in that the only way a camel owner can um, get the best out of his camel is by beating it very soundly in the morning. <laughs> and in a sense, you know, uh, I, I can say that of my creative spirit, if I can speak of it like that, which sounds pompous. And I, it's not, you know, I don't, I hope I never get used to thinking of words like creative spirit, you know. It's, it's so pompous to be like that. And maybe, maybe part of the, the wanting to be a recluse is so that I am alone with myself and not with 
whatever impressions people might have of me. And it is a bit oppressive to be expected to be good all the time. I don't expect that. I, I, it's, it's, it would, as I said, it would be oppressive to wander around with an idea of myself as already perfect. It's incredible. I would hate to think that. I, I would much rather, sorry. No, I would much rather think that, and I, and I do, every time that I sat down to do something, it's going to be a struggle. I'm not sure it's, it's, if it's going to succeed. And the, the pleasure is in the difficulty. You know, if, if I knew I was going to succeed, there'd be nothing to do, it'd be boring. Well, Manjula Padmanabhan, thank you very much. This has been a pleasure, and we thank appreciate you, you coming out of your uh, sure. metrosiveness. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Very thank much. you.